Meeple Nation podcast, episode 514, the top area movement games that we don't own. Welcome citizens to Meeple Nation. Grab your favorite beverage, pull up a chair, warm up those dice, and join us at the game table as we discuss board games and the board gaming world. Each week, the hosts of Meeple Nation share their love for board games and the amazing memories that come from playing games with some very outstanding people. Let us now join our hosts in their natural habitat, the game table. The Meeple Nation podcast is sponsored by Game Toppers LLC. Game Toppers are an absolutely fantastic product designed to convert any space into one of the best gaming spaces you've ever experienced. Throw these on a card table, throw these on your dining room table, throw them on the floor if you really wanted to, although they do make a leg kit for that. They do indeed. <laughs> you get this nice snap together military grade aluminum frame has a nice recessed surface you can throw a mat in there they've got tons of great accessories to go with it like i said leg kits dining room covers this can be a simple solution all the way up to a full blown epic game table so please go check them out at gametoppersllc.com and while you're on the internet we have a website that you should wander on over to that's MeepleNation.com. We have links to all of our past episodes. We have links to some blogs, some pictures. If you want to know more about us as hosts, you can check out our bios, which all can be found on that website, MeepleNation.com. Also on our website, you will find a link to our Patreon page. We love our patrons. Patreon is a way for our patrons to get a little bit more involved with the podcast and we try to pay that back by providing some extra content and being able to expand the tools that we use and for our patrons we are very grateful and we appreciate that if you too would like to be a patron on our webpage, you will find a link to that and uh, we would love to have you as a patron also if you have any questions comments games that should be on our radar you can always email us at meeplenation at gmail.com we love to chat, and uh, apparently we love a lot of stuff. We are a podcast of love. <laughs> it's true. There's no denying. <laughs> no denying It's just, just who we are, okay? <laughs> but all that can be found at MeepleNation.com, and uh, we can't wait to hear from you. Fantastic. Well, we are the hosts of Meeple Nation. I am Douglas Stewart. I'm Nathan Howard. And we are down and Andy today. Andy is home taking care of family. He had some familial duties. Is that the right word? Familial? Yeah. It seems like something you would summon, but yeah. maybe you could summon your family, too. <laughs> English is fun. He's taking care of his family tonight. We wish him the best. So it's just Nathan and I at the table tonight. And I'm excited to dive in to talking about what we have been playing this last week. Sounds exciting. I have been picking up a game that's been on my shelf. I had some goals to get some games off my shelf of shame this year. And you're doing a good job, I might add. Yeah. I'm getting well, through them. It's a pretty big shelf. It is. Well, it's it's a room. Yeah, it is a room of shame. <laughs> it could be for sure. But on that, I have pulled off a game called Dice Hospital. Yeah, this is a good one. Yeah, and we've enjoyed Dice Hospital Emergency Roll, which is a roll and write version of this game. It also has an implementation on BGA, and actually there's an implementation on BGA for Dice Hospital as well. But this is one that I've played here. I played with you, Doug, and Andy. Uh, it's I've played it with my wife a couple of times, and we're currently in our, I think, our second game on BGA. And this is, uh, it's a lot more challenging than uh, you first think. You just think, you're rolling dice, you're going to treat uh, your patients, and it is a little bit more complex than that. So you're going to roll your dice, and then everybody is going to pick an ambulance. Each of these ambulances is going to carry three dice, and the ambulances will go from the lowest pips to highest pips. If you can take that ambulance that has the highest pips on it, those patients are more healthy, because if you ever get a patient... Right which is the die. So if you ever get a patient to six and then you advance it or you heal it one more, then you, they're cured. you're cured. They're yeah. healed. Yep, they're all better. It's a miracle. However, if they go below one, then... Uh, wah, wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> no super serum, serum for them. <laughs> they are done for. Now, just 
time to start making funeral funeral arrangements at that point. Yeah. So each turn you're going to go through and you're going to take one of those ambulances. And then after that, you have the opportunity to take on either a specialist, which will allow you to heal a particular color of dye, heal matching numbers, heal matching colors. They have some sort of specialty that, uh, you know, they have their medical terminology, but that medical terminology boils down to dice manipulation, dice manipulation. Yes. <laughs> Which is really the essence of what this game is and, and, and is the fun part. And I like those specialists. They, they kind of give you a new um, tool to solve the puzzle, so to speak. Yeah. And then you also have particular departments that you can also add to your hospital. So yeah. radiology or anything like that, where you can, those rooms will allow you to effectively heal more patients heal. Uh, you could heal all of the same patients of, you could heal three of the same patients of the same color or maybe of the same number or heal a sequence of patients. So like if you had a two, three, four, you could heal all three of them once. However, in any of those rooms, if you do not match that complete qualification. So in that example, I use like a two, three, four, if you only have a two and a three, you Right. That office won't work. Right. Which which is why the game offers, I think, such a fun puzzle to solve, because you really do have to look for opportunities for the dice to, or to set the dice up. So maybe you use a different ability to set it up so that you do get that right combo. Then you can go use that room. You bump a bunch of dice up. They get healthier, you know, and then that lets you trigger another ability and then you can trigger an ability on an assistant and then you can use another room. And, and it's, I think it's really fun and you get these little wooden nurses, you know, and, and then the assistants come with a little, with a little pawn piece and you're moving those around your hospital. That's how you assign, you know, the jobs that need to be done and everything. I actually like this game. I think it's, I think it's good. And I really like, you know, you, you roll a whole handful of dice and you load up those, those little ambulances with them and you have to put them in order and everything. And you can take the healthier patients, but that means you're going to be last in line to pick some of the assistants and hospital wings and other perks. Right. So I like that because sometimes it's like, okay, hang on. There's some stuff out there that I really want. I'm going to take the unhealthy patients so that I have first dibs on getting the good stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of little decisions that add up to a game full of, I think, puzzly fun. You can have up to 12 patients in your hospital. Once you have, once you exceed that, then you're going to have patients that are passing away on you there. So you have to make sure that you are healing patients as patients. Yep. You have to make sure that you're healing patients. Yeah, that's right. Make sure you're healing patients fast enough so that you can always have room for incoming patients. Yeah, that's right. Because if you haven't cleared stuff out of your hospital and you get a, uh, an ambulance full of dying people, nothing to do with them. Yeah. So they just die faster. They just die faster. Yeah. <laughs> Colin Doogie Hauser. That's right. But yeah, Dice Hospital, I think is very fun. Next on my list to pull off, which is right next to that game, is Dice Theme Park. So right in the same kind of genre. So we'll see how uh, how that goes when we get that pulled off the table. Yeah, that's exciting. Very, very fun. Well, uh, this last weekend, my daughter and I decided that we wanted to go and try the... Uh, the expansion, one of the expansions for It's a Wonderful World, which is kind of a little mini campaign. And so we actually marathoned it. So we, yeah, so we played uh, all five of the War and Peace campaign games for It's a Wonderful World. So first of all, It's a Wonderful World is, is a great game. You start off with this empire card that's generating just a few resources and then everybody gets a big stack of cards. You draft seven, you know, in a, like in like a pick one, pass it kind of way. Right. As soon as everybody has seven cards, you decide which ones you want to chuck for resources and which ones you want to try to build as part of your empire. And and there's only four rounds of the game. And in that first round, you're not producing a lot of resources. You go through a resource uh, collection phase and you have to do it in order, which is part of the puzzle. You collect these resources, you try to build your features, but the more you get built, the more you produce. So, right. you know, in, in hopes that by that fourth round, you know, your empire is cranking out a lot of resources and you're able to build a lot of like really high scoring features. So this war and peace expansion, okay. My daughter and I sat down and, and kind of thought and talked about it after we were done. Probably the best thing that this expansion does is get you to play five games of it's a wonderful world <laughs> because, because the game is just good. 
I will admit that from a gameplay perspective, I think it was a little underwhelming. It wasn't bad, but it just, I think when you think about like introducing campaign elements or any kind of story or anything like that, I mean, the story for each of the little leaflets in each of the missions is like a little paragraph. And then it just gives you some quick instructions. So from a setup and instruction and learning point of view, really easy. Like this is not hard to get to the table at all whatsoever, but you know, you kind of start off I mean, I don't want to, I don't think there's much to spoil, but I don't, I don't want to like, it's go, only a paragraph. R- right. But well, and it's not the story, but I mean like the actual stuff that it throws at you. So like in the beginning, it has players working on like a community project. And then there are, depending on how that goes, it's going to give everybody sort of outcome cards based on whether they completed that objective and whether they were the winners or the losers. But what we kind of found was like the rewards for a lot of the, those campaigns were sort of like, hey, if you're the winner, you get this great card. Yeah, I remember and if, that. And if you're the loser, well, you also get a copy of this great card. It's just maybe not quite as great because we're scared of having runaway leaders. <laughs> you know, you, you could tell that that was like a consideration. And so, you know, with, with the exception of one of the missions, I think most of the stuff it threw at us was fairly underwhelming, but still really fun because the game is really fun. And we were, of course, playing with the Corruption and Ascendancy, I think is the expansion. That one is just always mixed in. So that adds an added layer of complication to the game. There was one of the missions that actually did some stuff that I thought was pretty cool it actually added like kind of a center row of cards that you could swap in and out of and thematically was kind of fun it comes technically with six scenarios but you hit a point in the campaign where you have to make a a a decision or depending on the outcome who wins you're only going to play one of the final two scenarios which is thematically kind of fun and everything anyway we really did have a good time i i actually do recommend this i know i'm not like giving it like glowing praise i really recommend it but i i mostly just recommend it because it's a really good excuse to go play It's a Wonderful World because it's an awesome game. It's a really fun little engine building game. Yeah, it is. Uh, It's one that I've had for a long time. It's one that hasn't come off the shelf for for a long time and one that may be on my chopping block. (gasps) What? Yeah, and but really? now that you've been talking about it, it does give me a little bit of uh, anxiousness to play it again, to experience it again. But it's just something that uh, it's just one that hasn't hasn't got to the game table. So, uh, and and I totally get that. You know, sometimes you have even good games that just don't get to the table, and it's like, well, what am I going to do with? It? I can sit on the shelf. It might be a great game, but it can sit on the shelf, or I can call it. And I get that. My copy's staying on the shelf. I really like It's a Wonderful World. I think it's a great sort of uh, midweight not too long. It's definitely more than filler, but you can play, you know, depending on player count, you can play it in an hour. If you don't have to teach, if everyone kind of knows what they're doing, you can play it in an hour, no problem. So I think it meets a lot of needs uh, when it comes to playing games and and managing groups and, you know, with different people. And if you do need to teach it, it's really not a complicated game to teach. Uh, If you are unfamiliar with It's a Wonderful World, just go play that. You definitely wouldn't want to jump into this campaign right out right out of the gate. You want to get a few games under your belt before you did that. And there is a little bit more of a robust campaign, uh, Leisure and Decadence, that we're going to play next. Um, we have some other games we want to get through first, but we're going to revisit It's a Wonderful World and play through that campaign. Now, that campaign has the same six envelopes with cards and everything in it, but it also comes with a bunch of boxes full of stuff. So we're a little intrigued. I think the rewards and the play are going to be a little more complicated. If nothing else, it's going to add more cards to what's available in the card pool, right? which is always something to be excited about in a game that gets played and you get kind of familiar with that card pool. You want to start seeing an influx of new stuff so that you can experiment with new strategies and stuff. So that's always kind of complicated. It's kind of a double-edged sword because it only goes the four rounds. If that deck is so thick, I mean, it does make replayability so that you're not counting on cards. Correct. And and there's enough repeats that you're going to see a good smattering of all those cards. You know, if they were all unique, then I I would agree. But even in a two player game, we were seeing a lot of the cards. We weren't seeing all the copies of all the cards, but we were seeing a lot of diversity in the card in, in the, in the pool, so to speak. Also in a two player game, it changes the number of cards that you give players at the uh-huh. beginning of a game based on the player count. And in a two player game with your, when you're playing with that corruption and ascendancy expansion, you actually get eight of the base cards and four of the corruption and ascendancy cards. So you start looking at 12 cards every round, which is a lot. 
That is, yes. And and you still only draft a seven. Everything else gets discarded. But I really like that. It gives you lots of stuff to look at and lots of options to choose from. It's it, it really is a good game. And we're looking forward to playing the other campaign. I do recommend it. If you like It's a Wonderful World, go check out War and Peace. I, I think it's super fun and gives you a reason to play It's a Wonderful World again and gives it just a little bit of a fresh take. Yeah, makes me want to pull it off the shelf and try it again. Maybe yeah. I don't want to call it. Yeah, let's do it. I always want to play It's a Wonderful World. I really like that game. In fact, I think the last time I played it was probably two years ago at your birthday celebration. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I am having a memory of playing it here at game night at some point, but uh, that might have even been before then. So yeah. I know we've played your copy at one point. Excellent. Well, those are some great highlights. Let's uh, let's get here to uh, some top area movement games that we don't own. A lot of these games also in, involve area majority, which we talked about recently. So there is some, okay, there's more than some. There are repeats in this list that were in our episode five episodes ago. Yeah. And, and just to kind of peel back the curtain a little bit, we kind of decided to go through some of these mechanisms and talk about some of these lists because typically it gives us an opportunity to talk about games that just don't get talked about very often. They get lumped into, into groups and, and they get us thinking about them in ways that we wouldn't normally think about them and to mention them. And, and I think it keeps things kind of fresh. What we've noticed though, some of the mechanisms and stuff we've been talking about lately, there have been a lot of repeats on some of these lists. And so I think, I think we're going to tread some familiar water, but there's still some interesting things I think to talk about and why we don't own some of these games. And I think it'll lead uh, to, to a good discussion. All right. So let's start it off. So let me emphasize this with when we went to BGG, we wanted to get games that had at least 2000 reviews and games that were rated between the seven to 10. So top review that had to have at least seven out of 10 stars or seven out of 10 rating. On that list, number one of games that we don't own is Root. We've talked about Root. Root was a game that we previously, that I previously owned. Uh, it was one that I culled simply for the reason that Root is a great game, but Root takes Root takes a lot of brain power to teach. For someone for you to teach Root, you have to know all the factions. And with the amount of games that we own collectively. You know, something like this just kind of gets to the point where it's a little too hard to teach. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we go back to that well a little bit because teaching is an issue and holding rules in our heads and, and everything like that definitely is part of it. But I would also add with Root that all of us have played it. Yeah. it this isn't a game that we've just been like, oh, that seems too complicated. No. You, you've played it a number of times. I've played it a number of times. It, it just never really set its hook either. And so you, you take a game that's just kind of like, well, it's okay. But, but didn't really like do anything. And then you add sort of this, this big barrier to always be like keeping up on it and learning rules and all that. You also add on to that, that we do know people who own this. I mean, if we ever wanted to play root, we don't need to own it to play it. We have right. people who own it, who we, we have could go access and play. to it. Yeah, we have access to it. So that's why we don't own that one. Uh, next on the list is Robinson Caruso. Now, this is one I'm kind of excited to yeah. try. I would love to get this to the table. Yeah. Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. Now, I have played this. I don't own it, but I have played it. The reason I don't own this is because Mike, our, one of our friends, he owns this and really likes it. He has all the deluxified everything for it. It's a really, really cool production and copy of the game. He's brought it over a couple of times. We've played it. We really liked it. It's a hard game. This is like one that's notoriously difficult for a group to overcome and win. In fact, I think we've played it twice and I think we lost it twice. <laughs> so, but it is a fun game. It's a really cool system. And if I'm not mistaken, this is, uh, this is an Ignacy Trevichek design. Am I getting the right person on that? Yes. Uh, Joanna Kijanka and Ignacy Trevichek. And, uh, and I like Ignacy. He's, he's a pretty cool guy just in general, but I also like his designs. He is the one that designed 51st state, which I really like. And he talks frequently about how he deliberately wanted this to be a difficult survival experience. And that's exactly what it is. Yeah. I'm excited. I like that the game is a challenge. I don't think cooperative games should be a walk in the park. I do think that there should be a chance of winning. Yes. <laughs> and well, there is a chance. And so I do, I am looking forward to this. Like you said, though, it does have a co high complexity of three at uh, 3.82 out of five weight. So it is definitely on the heavier side, but it 
It shouldn't take more than two hours, so I do like that. So if you're going to add in a teach, obviously that's going to take a little bit longer. Sure. But uh, the the playtime is great, even for a big, heavy, brain-burning game. That time is is nice that it's not overwhelming. It's not in that three-hour, four-hour mark. Yeah, 100%. Hopefully we can get that one to the table again sometime. I'll have to talk to Mike about uh, maybe bringing that one to game night sometime. Yeah. Because he likes it and he can teach it. So yeah, that'd, that'd be, be awesome. great. I'll reach out to him as well. Yeah. All right, the next one is one that we've talked about, uh, War of the Ring, second edition. Uh, we would love to play this. We would love for somebody to teach this to us. Absolutely. So maybe we'll try to set up something, see if there's anybody out there who uh, is willing to teach us come uh, November when we're all at BGG. Yeah. If we could just find somebody to teach us this and sit down, I would love to play it. Yeah. We'll have to we'll see if we can get that figured out. 100%. Next on the list is uh, Dead of Winter, a Crossroads game. Dead, Dead of Winter is actually a game that I like quite a bit. I think that this is also a really good cooperative game. Now, it does have that pesky little semi-cooperative caveat that I don't like very much. And uh, all, I'll, all I'll say is you can choose not to play with it. And I recommend that people don't play with that because it's annoying. But the game overall, I think, is super thematic and really fun. This is another one where it's actually Mike who owns all of this. He has uh, both of the, like, so Dead of Winter and um, the other Dead of Winter standalone game. He also has the Warring Colonies, the one that, like, pits them against each other and makes it a big battle and everything. So I just don't feel compelled to own it, but I will play it anytime it hits the table. This is one I used to own. I ended up calling it because I felt that I could kind of uh, run its course. I have picked up, and I'm anxious to get to the table, Freelancers, which is kind of along that same crossroads game. And so I'm anxious to get that to the table. Me too. But uh, Dead of Winter just kind of uh, kind of fizzled out for me. Great game. And I think uh, I would still play it again, but just uh, not enough to have it on my shelf anymore. Yep. To- totally get that. 100%. Next is a Game of Thrones, the board game, uh, second edition. And I actually do own this. Well, I've. I marked that I own it. It's actually Logan's copy. Oh, (laughs) but it is here on our shelf. So maybe we can kind of Game of Thrones is not something that has ever really shined for me. It's not a no, me neither. That is. Yeah, I I think collectively, with the exception of maybe Logan, I think we collectively just don't uh, care for this IP. We're we're probably in the minority there. I know this is (laughs) Game of Thrones is a hot, hot ticket item for sure. But yeah, I have I just have no interest. And so that's kind of the big reason on that one. Next on the list is uh, War of the Ring. This is just the first edition of War of the Ring, second edition. So obviously, you know, all, all kind of the same reasons, and we would play second edition anyway. Uh, the one after that, though, is El Grande. And this is one I want to learn. This is a fun game. I haven't played it for a long time, but they do have a re-release coming out, and that is on pre-order. So I don't know if, uh, if that should be on this list or not, but El Grande should be in well, the Lakash. Are in- you... Saying you've pre-ordered it? I am saying I've pre-ordered it. Nice. Yes. Okay. It should be within our collection soon. Okay. So don't own it, but will soon. And that that's exciting because I would like to play this. Yeah. I've wanted to try that one for a long time. Uh, We've mentioned the next one on the list before as well. That is Cthulhu Wars. This is just a big behemoth of a game. And I have honestly just heard that if you like that Cthulhu mythos and you like big war games, there are just kind of other games that do it better. So that's what I've heard. And given that this is huge and expensive and hard to track down and takes up a lot of shelf on, shelf space, shelf space, yeah, um, it's just not one I feel compelled to go and seek out. But I would play it. Next on the list is Oath Chronicles of Empire and Exile. Same thing, right along with Root. This is a game that I used to own, one that we have access to, but just uh, not one that we're anxious to uh, teach new players all the rules because honestly, we have. Too many games. We may have some issues. Maybe. I'm not seeking help, though. No, not soon. And next on, uh, right after that, is Sword and Sorcery is also another game that was previously owned. It was cold because there's a new version coming out that should be coming out in 2024. Yeah. And uh, we'll see how that is. Yeah. And I know Dave, I think, is really planning on championing this one, which is, I think, another reason why you and I and Andy in particular have backed off a little bit. Yep. He really likes this. He's had some experience playing it. And I know that when that new edition comes out, he's already talked about possibly picking that up. And I think he'll be the one that kind of pushes this one and we'll probably get it to the table. 
I think that one will be in our future. I don't know how far down the road it'll be, but I think we will get that to the table. It, Exciting. It's a dungeon crawl. So it is. It's, it's not an hard epic to... Yeah, an crawl. epic dungeon crawl. So uh, Andy's not here, but I know he's already sold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean by epic, it has a weight of 4.11. So it's a pretty hefty game. It is. Yes, it is. And that one game that Dave taught us, the one time we did sit down and, and played through the sort of the tutorial and first mission, it felt like a 4.11. Yeah, There's a lot it going was on. Very deep, but very cool. Thematically, super, super cool. I liked it a lot. Next on the list is Innis. Innis is one that uh, we've played. Our friend William taught us this at BryceCon a couple of years back, and we had fun with this, but not enough fun to have it anxiously added to our collection. Yeah. Well, there was also the added, and, and I love, I love William. Like he, he's, he is a good friend, great guy, but there was kind of the added, um, you know, you and I were trying to like figure the game out. It was, we were sort of trying to like, Oh, okay. Like, you know, there's kind of some interesting card drafting things that go on. The area control is interesting. The battles are streamlined and fun, but we were trying to like figure out how all that like worked together. And then he just like blew us out of the water. He was like, yeah, you guys weren't watching for this at all. You got to like, you, you got to get better at this kind of thing. And we both kind of looked at each other and we were like, well, <laughs> that's why you don't play with the vets <laughs> You're for your first game. You guys game. are new to this game, but I'm going to totally demolish you. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was definitely one of those moments. So, you know, I, I wouldn't turn Ennis down in the future, but it's just not one I feel compelled to go check out. Uh, next on the list is uh, Kemet, which I have the updated Kemet Blood and Sand. We've mentioned that before. We're going to get that to the table soon. And Pax Pamir kind of falls into the same category of game where we've talked about it so many times. I know a lot of people love it, but none of us feel super compelled. It has a really, really, really very, very text heavy cards. Yes. And, a, and just a graphic style that doesn't reach out and grab me and a theme and everything else that just, it looks like it's probably a really fun game for some people. And it doesn't seem like I would be one of them. And I'm totally judging. I fully <laughs> recognize I am in full judgment mode on that, but I'm I'm good. All right. The going on theme for the next one though, this one does look a little bit intriguing to me, and this is Chaos in the Old World. This is a little bit older game, 2009. Chaos in the Old World makes you a god. You have your distinctive powers and legions and followers, and you're trying to just make battle with opposing gods and Table presence looks pretty good. Oh, well, the, the miniatures are nothing fancy, especially by today's standards. I mean, you, we talked about Cthulhu Wars. This is a far simpler miniature appeal, table appeal, but the board is very fresh. The board is very nice looking and uh, the gameplay looks pretty good. This is yeah. one that I would be interested in checking out and playing for sure. Yeah, uh, me as well. This is an Eric Lang game. I like Eric Lang designs for the most part. And uh, this looks like one that I would love to check out. It just, need to, just needs to happen. just hasn't ha happened yet. And same thing with the next one, Forbidden Stars. Yep. Uh, this is another great uh, game that is an epic war battle. Your large armies, you're fighting, trying to uh, take over your territories. A lot of little miniatures in it. Well, a lot of minis that are in it. This looks uh, pretty good. Plus, it's uh, it's got that nice sci-fi theme. Yeah, that you love so I much. I do. <laughs> uh, Fantasy Flight Games game um, with uh, Samuel Bailey, James Sniffen, and Corey Konitzka. Yeah. So it's got also got some really good design pedigree there, too. Also I would like to check game. that out. Yes, it's a long one. Yeah. Yeah. That usually doesn't scare us away. <laughs> if, Sometimes. Yeah. Well... It depends on who we're playing. Not, not from purchasing. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't scare us purchase. from purchasing. It, oftentimes we'll keep it from hitting the game table, but uh, not from <laughs> pulling out our wallets. So this next one, uh, Conan, and we might have to take this one off the list too, because I just got an email notification this morning uh, that Andy backed the new version of Conan. <gasps> what? And so... Uh, Is that running on Kickstarter or Crowdfund? Or, uh, I can't remember. GameFound. It has to be Kickstarter because uh, I don't get emails from following okay. on GameFound. So it had to be Kickstarter. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm man, I might have to... I'm glad. That makes me really happy. I might have to go back at it like the $1 level just so I can get the updates and stuff. Yeah. I'm excited. That's one I want to play. So that's definitely one on my want to play list for sure. But yeah. It's an easier game, 2.75, but 90 minutes. That's great. Yep. And the, yep. the the miniatures look pretty cool. Uh, this is one that I would be excited to give a try. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now talk to me about Dune 
the 2019 version and Dune, the 1979 version, because those are the next two on our list. A lot of people really like these games. They do. They're definitely on the heavier side. Uh, It's going to be another three hour game. But the 2019 is a Gale Force 9 uh, re-update. of of the 1979 version. Yeah. And you, it's kind of funny. You look at the cover art is very nostalgic of the 1979 version, but this is this is an army you're trying to you're the Fremen, you're the uh, the different houses trying to gain control over the territory, trying to gain control of the spice. This is one that I actually thought I owned. And uh, in fact, I uh, had to go to my spreadsheet because I thought, well, it's not on my app. Maybe it's on my spreadsheet, but it is one, the 2019 version I don't own, but I would, uh, I would look to own it for sure. So that's the reason why I don't own it is because I'm sure Nathan will soon. Because he's a sucker. Sucker, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. And I love Dune as a, as a intellectual property. I think I that agree. it's really, really good. Um, I never got into those extended books, but that, that original Dune book and just a little bit of the, the after, uh, like supplemental writing and some of that stuff, I like the books after that, I never really got into, but that core book and some of the core story that's, that surrounds that I thought was really, really well done. Yeah. I think I made it through five of the Dune books. Did you? Before it kind of, uh, before it lost a little bit of interest to me, it just got too far down the storyline that it just kind of, the evolution just kind of lost me. It just didn't have its appeal anymore, but. Yeah. I've heard other people say similar things, but I also know there's a lot of people who are quite fanatical about the whole series Indeed. and love it to pieces. So yep. it is a very creative world and it definitely has peaked recently with the movies coming out, which I mean, those movies have been fantastic. Yeah. I, well, we haven't seen the second one yet, but the first one was fantastic. The second one looks amazing. Yeah. It's coming so, right around the corner. So. Yeah. I can't wait. Yep. Cannot wait. And the last one on our list is a game called Trajan. And this is one that our friends at Hug really enjoy. And every time we get together and meet, someone always brings up, hey, we should play Trajan. We really play Trajan. And I I think it's Sarah. Sarah loves to bring up playing Trajan. And so we just need to get the chance to play that. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, it's a little bit complex game. But uh, again, that time frame right there in that one to two hour range. So not uh, not too bad. Yeah. Yep. And it's it falls into that category of game for me that I just want to play it before I would buy it. You know what I mean? So I don't own it yet, but I might after if I play it and like it, you know, kind of recently had that experience with Maracaibo. Oh, so, you know what? So, no, I'm going to, sorry. I got to roll all of that back. I have played Trajan. Nice. In fact, at the last Sulcon, I got the chance to play Trajan. Okay. Well, how was it, Nathan? It, Cause it has the, um, it has the Moncala elements that are on the board. Yeah. No, I, this game did last like six hours though. Oh, so not an hour and a half. Uh, it lasted six hours because I was at the chatty table. Ah. And it was the best six hours of the con, I think. <laughs> was it really? We Yeah, we had a blast. We uh, we just, it was it was all laughing. It was all catching up. And uh, it was not the best game of the con, but I had a lot of fun playing this. This was the game that um, Sarah loves and she said she loves, but she's terrible at teaching it. And that's a big part of why it took so long. Because we were just constantly making fun of her. uh, Yeah, I love this game so much, but I can't teach it. But good times. So I have played Trajan. Nice. No, that's great. I sort of had this experience with Maracaibo recently because it kind of fell into that category of game that it was just like, I don't really have a lot of interest in it at face value. And ironically, I just got a Sarah DeWitt Facebook post. Oh. It's like she's kidding me. live, me. live yeah. right here on the park. live right there. <laughs> yeah, I awesome. know you're talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. No, but it, like Maricaba, I was just, I did, I really didn't have any interest, but I, I wanted to play it before I bought it. Andy, you know, went and played it and, uh, taught it to us. And now I absolutely love Maricaba. Love Maricaba. And now I'm just Maricaba. like tortured. I'm just like, I, I really want to go buy it, but Andy owns it. I don't really need it. And, uh, and would it get played if I added it to my collection kind of thing? But that game is so good. Fortunately, there's a fantastic BGA implementation. And I think that's going to, I think that's going to be enough for me for now. I really want to try to teach this to my wife because I really want more people to play this game because I love this game. Yeah, It's Maricaba been a while. Good since I've had a game that I'm like so anxious to play again. Yeah. 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 It's it. Maracaibo is great. And if 
Pirates of Maracaibo is even nearly as good as Andy said it was. I'm super excited about that. Yeah, definitely. Well, those are the top rated area movement games that we don't own. Yeah. Top 20. Or 20-ish. Ish. Ish. Yeah. <laughs> what what even is num- what even is? What even is numbers? What even, what even is, is English? <laughs> <laughs> I are good at it. <laughs> and on that note, until next time. <laughs> we'll see you at the game table. Thank you for listening and being a part of Meeple Nation. If you would be so kind as to follow, subscribe, share, and rate or review this podcast, it really helps to spread the fun. You can be more involved in supporting the podcast by joining the nation at patreon.com slash Nation, or you can find a link at the top of our webpage, meeplenation.com. And while you're there, look at all our extra content. There are links to all our past episodes, a wide variety of blogs, pictures from our Instagram feed, and bios for all the hosts and our awesome bloggers. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all under Meeple Nation. If you would like to chat with the hosts or other members of the nation, you can join our Facebook group, Meeple Nation Off Air. We hope to see you again at a game night, a con, or maybe a suspense-driven evening of Werewolf. Thank you for listening and supporting Meeple Nation, and stay tuned for next week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. We very much want to thank our patrons who help keep the podcast running. I personally want to thank my co-hosts for all the help they provide with both content here on the podcast in addition to what we have available on our website. Without them, the podcast would not happen. If you too would like to support the podcast, you can join the nation at patreon.com forward slash meeple underscore nation. Or you can find a link to Patreon at the top of our webpage, meeplenation.com. If you have any questions, comments, or games you feel should be on our radar, you can always reach us at meeplenation at gmail.com. We can't wait to hear from you. I am grateful to Doug and Andy who helped me edit episodes. And I want to thank James and Kim Clark who do the editing on our blogs and on our webpage, which can be found at meeplenation.com. We want to thank Brain Detergent for our music. If you want to find more from him, you can follow his links that can be found on our webpage or simply search for Brain Detergent on YouTube to find more of his tracks. Thank you again for listening and being part of the Meeple Nation community.